It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Maria Bruno. Maria is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Archaeology at Dickinson College. Her research examines the long-term dynamics of indigenous agricultural systems in the Lake Titicaca Basin of the Andes using ethnobotanical and archaeobotanical methodologies. A major component of this research includes the study of the origins of agriculture in the region, specifically the domestication and diversification of quinoa and quinoa. This is accomplished through analysis of seed morphology in modern and ancient specimens using various microscopy techniques. Great. Well, welcome and looking forward to hearing your presentation. So thank you everyone for including me um, in this uh, great international session on quinoa. Um, I'm very excited to be able to share some of my research and work of some of my other colleagues. Um, about what we know from the archaeological record about the long history of quinoa in the Andes. So a little bit of an overview of my talk today. Um, I'm going to start with just a short discussion of how we study um, the histories of crops um, through different methodologies. Um, and then I'm going to focus a little bit on what archaeology is and um, the subfield of archaeology known as archaeobotany in which we examine archaeological plant remains um, and has been the main way in which we've um, been able to investigate the history of quinoa. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about what we know about quinoa domestication and I'm going to focus in particular on what we know about its domestication in the Andean region in the high Andes mountains. And then I'm going to kind of zoom in a little bit more in the region that I work in, um, the Lake Titicaca Basin, which is um, a high lake that sits between um, the two ranges of the Andes Mountains between Peru and Bolivia, and talk a little bit about what we know um, about when quinoa was adopted there and the trajectory of its use um, in what we would be considering prehistory and even a little bit into more historic times. So there's, um, in the past, I don't know, 25, 30 years, we've made some really amazing strides in how we study the origins of agriculture and the domestication of crops and animals around the world. Um, and many of the participants in this um, session this week um, are people who've kind of been pioneers in the study of um, using um, molecular genetics and the phyto, um, um, the relationships, the evolutionary relationships between living plant populations, such as the living ancestors of quinoa, um, the quinopod that was domesticated in North America, and then down into the Andes. Um, and so these botanical and molecular approaches to the origins of any crop around the world, but particularly quinoa, have been really helpful for us in understanding um, what the progenitor populations was, so who was the ancestor of our domesticated quinoa, which um, botanists identified as being Quinopodium hircinum, um, and more recent genetic work has sort of verified that, and then shown how that um, species was likely domesticated, possibly sort of independently in both um, the highland Andes region of the Andes, and then another species known as quinoa del mar um, on the coast of Chile. Um, so this botanical and molecular evidence really is helpful for us for pin pinpointing sort of where these processes took place, what species were involved, and then can get us obviously thinking about the phenotypic changes that come with crop domestication, but also those underlying genetic ones. Um, and my colleague, um, Dr. Batero, will be speaking of some of that work in terms of understanding other aspects of the plant's physiology. Um, archaeology has always played a really important role in understanding domestication, even before we had the technologies associated with the molecular biology. Um, archaeologists, um, you know, beginning in the late 1800s, early 1900s, began recovering plant remains um, from archaeological sites across the Andes. Um, so it's great to be able to see these ancient plants, look at what they look like in the past, maybe how they've changed over time and into the present, um, and perhaps more importantly, in terms of um, figuring out how this process occurred, is we can radiocarbon date large plant remains. And that gives us the most precise idea of when these things would have occurred. So while um, molecular science can kind of give us a little bit of clock in terms of like when genetic changes uh, might, how long they may have taken to occur, those are often rooted in the dates that we get from archaeological sites and archaeological plant remains. 
Um, so today I'm going to focus on what archaeologists have been able to uncover about the processes of quinoa domestication using these archaeological plant remains. And then the second part of my talk will really speak to how um, finding where these plants occurred and the kind of broader social and political context in which these um, plants were used and modified gives us a better insight into why people would have shifted to using domesticated plants and some of the other um, cultural and environmental factors that were going along in terms of people changing the ways that they were living in the world by depending on domesticated species. Okay, so this is a picture of our archaeological project on the shores of Lake Titicaca in um, Bolivia in the southern lake basin. Um, so archaeologists, again, I think any impression that you might have of them coming into this um, symposium is that we dig in the earth and we certainly do that. Um, and here we are working with our colleagues, our Bolivian colleagues, as well as our Aymara colleagues who are the residents, um, continue to live and cultivate these lands and then participate in the archaeological projects with us. So the subfield of archaeology that specializes in the plant remains that come out of these archaeological sites is known as archaeobotany. And we have a wide range of plant remains that we can examine. Um, I'm going to be focusing today on what are known as macro botanical remains. So you can see here in this picture, and I'll explain why in a minute, why we really just focus on the, those little black plants. Those are plants that have been carbonized, and because they're carbonized and kind of neutral, they can last in the ground for thousands and thousands of years without decomposing. Um, so macro botanical remains normally consist of um, wood, um, tissue of tubers, and then of course seeds, which we'll be focusing on. Um, plants also make other kinds of cells that will preserve archaeologically. Um, my Argentinian colleague um, Pilar Babak has studied, um, these are some images of quinoa starch grains that she's identified um, on tools um, that they have recovered from sites in Argentina. So these um, starch grains or phytoliths can also be recovered from soils and on tools. Um, some of these um, these cells may not be as um, uh, susceptible to changes related to domestication, and they are also a little harder to um, date. And so really it's very helpful to have macrobotanical remains because we can see those changes and then date them when we find them. Um, so just to give you a little sense of how we do this, um, as we excavate every context that um, we separate out as we're excavating, we take um, a 10, this is at least where I work in the Lake Titicaca Basin, it'll vary from region to region, but we take about 10 liters of soil from every specific context, and then we put it through what's known as water flotation. So we have this system of water of buckets um, and water that's floating in, um, and we dump that soil into the water, um, and the light things float up to the top and come over the little um, water flow here, and a lot of those things are burned plant remains. Um, we also capture some stuff in another screen that's below here, which often has like fish bones and maybe larger pieces of plants. So then we take that sample, which becomes very small from that big 10 liter bucket of dirt, um, and then we can look at it under a stereo light microscope. Um, and again, like I mentioned, in this region of the world, only carbonized things preserve. On the coast of Peru, for example, or Chile, where it's extremely dry, you may get just desiccated plant remains. Um, a colleague of mine, um, Laura, um, wh who works in southern Bolivia, they find in caves um, uncarbonized quinoas, which are really amazing. But what I work with mostly in the, much of these older sites are carbonized remains. So we sort out the different types of species that we find, and then we can look at them more specifically. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn to quinoa now. Um, I've included a, a, a song. So um, some colleagues of mine, um, Denise Arnold and Juan de Dios Yapita, have recorded um, some of the traditional songs that Aymara farmers sing as they prepare their crops. And one of the songs sung for quinoa is Waranc Waranca, which means thousands of thousands. Um, this plant, as everyone here I'm sure participating knows, um, this plant produces an abundant number of seeds on each of its panicles, um, and they get everywhere. And so I have this picture of a woman threshing her quinoa, um, and this is good for archaeologists, right? These seeds are kind of durable little um, uh, entities. They go everywhere, whether or not you want them to or not. They are very likely to get into a fire, and because of that, they are very abundant in the archaeological records. So this is just a picture of 
all of the kinopods that we've picked out of one of one of those samples and you can see the variation that um, uh, is here in what's left in those seeds. So thankfully quinoa is actually just a wonderful species to study its domestication because it is ubiquitous so and by that I mean it appears in almost all of the samples that we encounter at least in the Titicaca Basin and in a lot of other places where it's produced. So it occurs across many different kinds of archaeological contexts and then it's dense in the fact that we usually get many more than one little seed. We get hundreds of seeds in any given sample. And they're large enough in size that once we've studied that seed, we can send it off to a radiocarbon date, um, uh, to an AMS date, and actually get the very seed dated. So we can know exactly, or within a range of radiocarbon range, how old that plant is. All right, so I'm gonna turn now to how archaeobotanists can study the domestication of quinoa and the things that we look for in the morphology of these seeds that allow us to determine if the seeds that we're looking at are wild or if they've been domesticated. Um, so again, this is probably no mystery to the people participating in this um, symposium, but um, their quinoa presents itself with a lot of different variation, right? Even in wild plants, you'll get seeds that are black and a few that are white. Um, but in the cultivated varieties that we know, they tend to be light colors such as white and yellow, I um, mean, maybe red. Um, but the wild quinoa in the Spanish speaking world or in South America is known as quinoa negra because it's black. It has a black seed, whereas the cultivated one tends to be a lighter color. Um, when we look at the morphology that creates the difference in these colors, um, there's a lot of actually other different things that we can look at. Um, so one of the changes over a long period of time that we might see, and this is with um, several other crops as well, is that the seed tends to get larger. So humans, as they selected for certain species, they often want uh, more food for what they're, right? So they're selecting for bigger grains. Um, in actuality, there's not a huge difference, or at least statistically, between some of the domesticated species and the wild ones. So that doesn't seem to be the most important attribute that we can look for for identifying a domesticated seed. Um, but the other things related to the seed coat um, and some of the technical terms, the outer seed coats known as the testa, the texture of that seed coat, and then the shape of the seed itself um, seems to vary with the thickness of that seed coat or the testa. So what we can do as archaeologists, and this is, I should point out, um, a method that was established first in North America as archaeobotanists there were figuring out that the North American indigenous peoples had actually domesticated a species of quinoa or quinopodium as well. Um, and they looked at comparisons between modern wild quinopods and um, domesticated ones. And the main change that we can observe with a scanning electron microscope and zoom in on it is the thickness of that outer um, seed coat or the testa. So this is a modern wild quinoa negra. You can see how thick that seed coat is versus um, a, uh, this is also again a modern um, quinoa seed domesticated and it's just paper thin, it's testa thickness. Um, so as archaeologists we can identify these seeds that might be a little more beaten up and maybe the whole testa is not preserved but we can zoom in on it and measure the testa thickness and study after study has shown that the wild species have a thicker testa than the domesticated species. So generally speaking, again, this will vary from variety to variety or species to species um, in different parts of the Americas. Um, but in the Andes where I've worked, we've found that domesticated species tend to be less than 10 microns. Um, and in the case of that uh, quinoa del mar, it may have completely lost that outer um, testa. So um, that's really interesting to see. Um, and then as you can see in this picture, um, even without the scanning electron microscope, you can begin to see these differences between the wild and domesticated seeds. So these little wild quinoa negra seeds really pop out. They still appear um, in agricultural context because these would have been weeds that were growing alongside um, the domesticated species. And then the seeds here that look a little smoother, um, those are the ones that are likely the domesticated ones. And so, um, Several colleagues of mine have been working on this in different parts of the Andes. Um, um, if you want to read more about that, I'll point you to an article that I published um, with Maria Teresa Planella and Laura Lopez, my colleagues in Chile and Argentina, where we summarized this, some of this work that's been, gone, that's been done in different parts of the Andes. Um, 
What I want to focus on now a little bit is what we know specifically for um, the domestication of the Andean species, because this is really where um, I would say we still need a lot more work on this question. It's certainly not completely answered, but the work that's been done so far in terms of identifying morphologically domesticated species, so these seeds that have thin seed coats and then have um, radio, ideally they've been directly radiocarbon dated, this is what we have. Um, so you may have read studies of some um, quinoa seeds found in the north coast of Peru um, that date to a bit earlier, about 5000 BC, but those have not been subjected to the more detailed morphological analyses that I'm talking about here. Um, so in, there were a series of caves that were um, excavated in the, Ayuk, in the Junin region of Peru um, in the early 1990s. Carol Nordstrom was a graduate student, was sort of one of the first people to apply this use of SEM, scanning electron microscopy, to look at the differences between wild and domesticated quinoas. And she identified domesticated varieties that dated to a level in the archaeological site that was about 3,000 years um, before the current era. So the seeds themselves weren't domesticated, but they came from a layer that dated to that time. Um, subsequently, work um, by myself and Felissa Eisentrout um, in a site in northern Peru and sites in southern Bolivia, or around the Lake Titicaca Basin, um, we both identified morphologically domesticated quinoa seeds, and they were directly dated to 1500 um, BCE. Um, interestingly enough, the reason I bring up why it's important to actually date the seed is because the seeds were found in a layer that was dated with wood that were about 3000 BCE at Calcutani, Peru, but when they actually dated the seed, it was a bit younger. So these little seeds can move around in archaeological sites. So this is why we tend to put some stress on actually trying to date the seeds themselves or the object that the thing has come from. Um, so based on that, there's been some interesting ideas about how quinoa and why quinoa was domesticated in the Andes. And um, work by my colleague Deborah Pearsall, who did the initial um, study of those seeds from the Hunin region, um, as well as some other scholars have proposed that um, those who study the domestication of camelids see that those animals were actually probably taken under control and domestication um, before plants were. And as we know, so I have a little picture here um, these camelids, llamas and alpacas, um, eat the plants around them and they also eat quinoa. So um, this is actually a seed in quinoa dung that's from an archaeological site. So there may have been this sort of co-evolutionary relationship where wild stands of the progenitor of the domesticated quinoa um, was not only attracted to the disturbances that humans were creating in the places that they were living, but that these animals were also kind of bringing those plants into the lives of the people who were harvesting them. So based on our radiocarbon dates, we can imagine that people were beginning to collect and manage wild quinopods as they were moving their plants around or their herds of um, llamas around. And then around um, 3000 or 2000 BCE, they would have started to domesticate them. And then they become these fully domesticated plants that um, people um, transition to depending on, right? So we go from people gathering these wild species and using them as food to then planting them and kind of committing themselves to a really change um, of lifestyle where they become farmers, right? Where they're, they're committed to these crops, they plant them, they care for them, they harvest them, they become less mobile and more wedded to the particular landscape. Um, and so the more we've been thinking about this, and my colleagues and I working on the Turaco Peninsula um, have been looking at where we find these things, where we find domesticated quinoa show up, it often is with other, with fully domesticated camelids and also even potatoes. So um, in the Near East, they've often talked about this sort of Neolithic package where wheat and barley, um, and then eventually sheep and cows um, become domesticated and move around and spread to other parts of Eurasia. Um, and maybe perhaps we have similar kind of agropastoral package in the Andes that includes camelids, quinoa, and potatoes. <clears throat> so I'm gonna spend the last bit of my um, presentation here talking about what happens, particularly in the Lake Titicaca Basin, as we look at the use of quinoa through time, um, about up until the Inca conquest, when we've had quite a few archeological pro um, projects in this region that have systematically collected plant remains um, and can track these things through time. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the earliest dates that we have both from the northern part of the lake basin and the southern part of the lake basin are about 2000 or 1500 years before the current era. 
and that often includes the appearance of domesticated camelids and tubers. So we consider these people the first agriculturalists in this region. And it happens to coincide with a time prior to this, this lake basin was actually very, very cold and dry for several thousand years. But the climate seems to have ameliorated around this time um, and that it made kind of the perfect place for people to settle down and become farmers. Um, so the main time periods, I'm going to kind of, this is again, just kind of a brief overview, but as you can see here, what we call the formative period is this really long period between about 1500 and 1500 BCE and 200 um, in the current era, where lots of things changes. But this is where we consider if you're comparing this again to the old world, kind of our Neolithic, where people become farmers and become increasingly dependent on that. Um, their societies also populations grow and become more complex and this results eventually around um, 300 current era the rise of the Tiwanaku state which is the first large kind of political entity um, in the this part of the Andes. So we've been able to track the use of different crops um, across this time so our project the Traco archaeological project has mostly focused on the formative period so you, when you look at these um, sample numbers, you'll see that our sample sizes for the formative periods are much larger from the Tiwanaku. But what you can see is, first of all, ubiquity is the percent in which we find these species in our samples. So it means that quinoa is present between 80 and 100 percent of our samples um, almost across every time period. So you, and parenchyma is storage tissue. So we can't say what kind of tuber this plant might be coming from, but you can also see that tuber tissues are quite prominent in all of our samples. Um, we do have this little bit of a drop here in quinoa. I think that has to do with our sample size. I, I'm gonna, in my next slide, I'll show that quinoa did main, be, stay very important food even during the Tiwanaku time. But what I want you to take away from here is quinoa uh, increases important through time. Um, tubers seem to increase um, later in time, but they are kind of this important staple crop. Um, these samples come from my colleagues who've worked at the site of Tiwanaku itself. And you can see up here, right, in all of the sites that they've studied, all of the samples they've studied, quinoa is present in over 90% of them. So it is literally everywhere. But what's interesting is you see this continued increase of parenchyma or potentially tuber cultivation. And then here comes maize, this crop that um, originally domesticated in Mexico, but then makes its way into the Andes quite early, and then eventually up into the highlands. So quinoa and tubers really are a staple food throughout the formative and the Tiwanaku period. Um, even in the Tiwanaku period, when maize, this kind of fancy crop, makes an appearance, probably to be drunk as chicha, um, these foods like quinoa are the kind of still the important foods feeding populations. Um, so my last example is from this later time period called the Pacajes or the late intermediate period. So the Tiwanaku state collapses and these communities develop into sort of more um, independent autonomous um, chiefdoms or senorios, you may have heard of as that. So my colleague Brianna Langley um, worked at a site excavated by Liz Arcouche and this is in the northern part near Puno. So people were living at the top of these um, outskirts or these hilltops during the late intermediate period. And what they found in excavating their um, house compounds were just literally millions of quinoa seeds. Um, Brianna would show me like a giant Ziploc bag filled with quinoa seeds, ancient quinoa seeds. So what's really remarkable is this time period is kind of thought to have been maybe more a focus on just herding camelids because you could kind of keep them up there. But what they did was terrace this entire hillside and cultivate quinoa and some tubers, absolutely zero maize um, in this interesting time period. Um, so with the conquest of the Incas and the Spanish, of course, this, you know, any kind of conquest kind of impinges on people's kind of livelihoods to some extent, um, particularly with the Spanish. New crops were introduced. So in the Titicaca Basin region, in, in particular, faba beans and barley become really important crops. Um, the haciendas, so the, um, the sort of uh, land owners from the city who owned the agricultural lands that the indigenous people still populated, tended to focus their crops on things that they could sell in the city. So potatoes and chuño, and again, maybe even maize and faba beans. Um, but 
so when I, you know, in the 2000s, when I've been working on this region, um, quinoa is definitely less prominent in these Titicaca Basin communities than it once was in the past. Um, it, you know, other foods have replaced it. Um, but as you can see from this woman who has her nice little um, stand of drying quinoa, people still produce, you know, grow it, um, you know, every other year for household consumption. Um, and it's still a crop that people know about and, and enjoy and often reminisce about how before the introduction of bread and things like that, it was the food that they ate every day, that their grandparents ate every single day. With that, um, I'd like to conclude by thanking the various um, institutions that have supported this work and my colleagues along with the Traco Archaeological Project and of course the communities that have participated and taught me so much about quinoa. And finally, I would like to dedicate this to two Bolivian scholars who um, without their support and help would have never, I would not even be speaking to you here today about this. Um, one is who recently passed away, Juan de Dios Yapita is an Aymara, um, was an Aymara linguist and he was fundamental in translating a lot of the interviews that I conducted. And Eduardo Pareja was an archeologist who helped me get the permits to do the projects that I'm presenting for you today. So along with the indigenous communities that have brought us this amazing crop, I want to recognize these two scholars. Thank you.